Thank you, Jeremy. We now, I mean, ended the, the, the first lot of the session, which was entirely focused on the carriage of passenger by sea. And uh, we have now, I mean, other two slots. The first one is uh, focus on uh, marine hull underwriting and uh, claims. And uh, we have the point of view of uh, two very prominent uh, law firm, one British and uh, one Italian, of a senior underwriter and of a, and, uh, a leading professional salvers. Uh, so the first, the first speech will be given by uh, Campbell Johnson Clark, and uh, we will have two speakers. The first one is uh, Filippo Lorenzon, director of the Institute of uh, Maritime Law, consulting with uh, Campbell Johnson Clark, and the second speaker will be just after uh, a founding partners, Mr. Uh, Julian Clark. I leave the floor to Filippo Flor Lorenzon. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Indeed, we are in two today, but uh, um, this is how we're going to play it. The first five minutes is going to be me talking about a major casualty, and uh, the second five minutes is going to be Julian talking to you about what we have learned from these casualties, the lessons to be learned in dealing with major ones. The casualty I'm talking about today is the Aconcagua. The Aconcagua is a very famous case uh, which reached the court a number of times. The vessel is a 2,226 TEU, mid-size for the time, um, container carrier. It was her second maiden voyage and she was doing a line of service from the Far East to the USA and South America. On the 28th of November 1998, she shipped a cargo of 334 kegs, which is kind of little barrel, apparently, of calcium hypochlorite in a container in Busan, South Korea. And she was going to uh, San Antonio in Chile. The bill of lading which was released on delivery of the uh, container described the cargo as one container set to contain calcium hypochlorite, 65%, and it contained a declaration of dangerous cargo by saying IMO 5.1, UN 1748, and other details. The bill was subject to the Hague rules. When the box was, when the box was stowed, it was stowed on, uh, in number three holds, and she, it was surrounded by three tanker bunker tanks, which... At the time of loading, um, nobody knew whether it was necessary to um, heat them or not, but indeed, this is the way the uh, loading plan um, was, was thought. The vessel uh, carried other cargo operation in Keelang, in Hong Kong, and Los Angeles, but on the 30th of, of December 1998, bang, this happened a bad day in the office for a number of people. The vessel was abandoned for how serious the accident was. Mercifully, no seamen lost their lives, but the vessel was very, very heavily damaged and it kept burning. She kept burning for three weeks after that. Salvage operations and all that stuff to follow. On the legal side, what next? Well, first of all, uh, owners and charters went to arbitration under the terms of the Charter Party, which was an NYPE amended form, again, Hague rules. And uh, further to the arbitration, um, while the um, arbitration was under appeal, a settlement was reached and the uh, owners received £27,750,000 under that settlement agreement. So, at the time, the charters were left with the loss, and therefore they had to go to court and sue the shippers in the High Court. The reason why they didn't do arbitration is because there was no arbitration clause in the Bill of Lading, so it was a straight uh, Queen Bench Division case. The charters claimed that the uh, dangerous cargo was the reason for the, um, for the damage, the... Uh, the Charters case was that the hypochlorite was really 
bad, it was rogue cargo, it went off in ordinary uh, carriage temperature for that voyage at that time of the year. The shipper, on the other hand, said that the cargo was not abnormal and uh, the fact that the box was stowed near to the um, tanks was the reason for the explosion and therefore they were in breach of Article 3, Rule 2 of the Hague Rules as applicable under the carried contract. Now, what was decided was as follows. There was an issue of unseaworthiness, which we don't have the time to deal with, but it was decided that the vessel was not unseaworthy uh, before and at the beginning of the voyage, and uh, that although CSAV, which was the charter of the vessel, was in breach of Article 3, Rule 2 of the rules, they were exempted by Article um, 4, Rule 2A, because uh, even if the reason for the explosion was the tank's heating uh, um, moment of the carriage, that was indeed just a operation in the management of the ship, and therefore it carried no liability for the carriers. And therefore, um, Mr. Justice Christopher Clark decided that the, the uh, charters were indeed entitled to receive an indemnity from the shippers. The uh, shippers appealed and went to the Court of Appeal. The appeal was based on a very, very technical point, which I won't be boring you with, but the Mr. Uh, Lord Justice Longmore did, up, uh, did uphill, uh, upheld the appeal, uh, the, um, the decision of Mr. Justice Clark, and said that something which I found extremely, academically extremely interesting, he said that if there are, in cases of dangerous cargo, if there are, there are two possibilities. Either the cargo has been carried in a bad manner and therefore the carrier is guilty, or the cargo was rogue and therefore the shipper is guilty. There is no third possibility. And he held, in this case, that the carrier was not negligent at all and therefore it must follow that the liability would lie with the shipper. What this took, very few minutes, what this took was 10 years of litigation, arbitration proceedings lasting six weeks, two decisions of the High Court, one decision of the Court of Appeal, new law and the first ever limitation fund in Chile, and an extremely complex enforcement proceedings. And Julian will now tell you about what he learned from these proceedings altogether. Thanks, Filippo. <laughs> All right, so what do you learn from a case such as that? This is the dangerous goods case, she's a container ship. Uh, but what you learn from a case such as this applies equally to any kind of major casualty. So I uh, submit to you that what I'm about to say you can apply to the handling of ever, any major casualty and follow these guidelines. This is the kind of things that we learnt over the 10 years. Um, so these are the key points that you've got to look for. It, we're talking about collation and preservation, preservation of evidence, absolutely crucial. It is the number one thing you've got to look for. <clears throat> Selection of the right team. Right team is fantastic. You've got to get the team, you've got to get the team playing together. Why don't England beat Italy whenever we meet you in the World Cup? We've got international players that are fantastic, they don't play as a team. The way you lose major litigations is having a team that don't play as a team. Doesn't matter how good they are, if they're not playing as a team, it ain't gonna work. 200% attention to detail in these cases. You've got to watch every single moment of these cases and keep the eye on the ball at all times. And that also means keeping a weather eye on the tactical position. So what you adopt effectively is a casualty management checklist. Let me just hit through some of those bullet points that I've just given you and uh, talk, talk to you a bit more about them in the remaining time. Physical evidence. This case, all the way to the Court of Appeal, 10 years, all really about that point uh, decided by the Court of Appeal, was this a rogue cargo, was this a normal cargo affected by heating of bunker tanks? <clears throat> the problem that we had straight away in relation to the cargo on the Aconcagua was there was nothing left. Ship was on fire for three weeks. 
Every box on that ship uh, was burnt. What effectively happened with that ship was uh, she was taken back to the yard where she'd been constructed, the bow was taken off, the accommodation was taken off, and a new central se section put in because everything in the central section, including the bulkheads, had been fundamentally destroyed by the fire. The only reason that she wasn't a CTL was the fire stopped before it hit accommodation and engine room. So where do you get the cargo from? There's, no, there's nothing left of this box. And following this incident, you may remember, there was a whole series of these box ships casualties. CMA Jakarta, DG Harmony, Conship France. They were all calcium hypochlorite coming out of the Far East. All the major lines suddenly refused, and today you'll see the same provision in charters. Nobody carries calcium hypochlorite. After the events of the Akon, the only line that would take calcium hypochlorite was Maersk. Maersk would only carry it in a reefer box. How do you get this cargo? How do you get samples out uh, of, of, of the country, out of the jurisdiction? We thought of something that we thought was slightly out of the box. We managed to get a one kilo sample <clears throat> from the same factory, given over to the master of uh, a CSAV vessel in order for him to personally carry it so we could get it out of the country. That vessel wasn't coming into the UK, it was coming into the States. But in the States, the idea was we'd hand it over to one of the ships that was on liner service into Europe, and we'd get that, that uh, sample back. It was a little one kilo drum, silver case. Um, it didn't go exactly as planned, because on the day that the vessel got to Los Angeles, I was called by the operator to say there was a problem. <clears throat> the problem was, as the vessel had come on board, US Coast Guard had got on board the ship, and just as the US Coast Guard got on board the ship, the old man thought, I've got a silver drum of something in my cabin that I've been told to hand over to another CSAV uh, master, and I have no idea what it is. So I'm going to open up this silver drum and find out what it is. So he opened up the silver drum and found out that it was a kilo of white powder. So he threw it over the side. <laughs> What we then had to do was really start thinking out of the box, and eventually what we bought was we bought container loads of calcium hypochlorite uh, to run tests on. So physical evidence, absolutely crucial. Electronic evidence becomes crucial. Evidence about the Bapley files, the way these cargoes are loaded, what's written down. One of the crucial bits of evidence in the Aconcagua case were handwritten notes made by the chief officer on the stowage planner's hard sheet printout of the Bapley file in Busan, where there was evidence that potentially uh, there'd been a positive intervention, as you, as you will know from Clause 8 of an NYPE form charter, in circumstances where it's unamended, so it's under the supervision of the uh, master, the responsibility lies with the charterer. One of the ways to swing that pendulum back is by showing that there's been a positive intervention. Safety management system became important because you could drill through the safety management of the ship in, as a charterer to see if there was a way to uh, win a case there. And in major casualties now, the electronical systems, the dangerous goods systems, the Dago systems become vital. The evidence of what happens with Ectis becomes vital. Um, you're probably all familiar with what happened with the um, Costco Busan, where she hit the central span of the Golden Gate Bridge. And why did she hit the central span of the Golden Gate Bridge? Because the pilot on board thought that the red triangles uh, marked the gaps between the span, where the red triangles on a neck disc actually mark the span. So he took the ship in fog directly on a collision course into the bridge. So evidence about what's happening electronically becomes very important in these cases. Crew evidence. Another thing about the Aconcagua, we're talking about overheating of bunker tanks. I can tell you that tanks were heated to 63.3 degrees and 58.4 degrees. How do I know that? Because the second engineer had written those marks in marker pen on the tool fuel gauges. So it's a matter of looking for evidence in usual places. Uh, and the other thing now today to warn you of in the last couple of minutes left is be very aware in relation to English matters, matters going for the English courts, English jurisdiction on disclosure and the requirements now in relation to e-disclosure. Uh, we have just had a case, relatively straightforward, charter party dispute. There's quite a lot of money involved, uh, but the disclosure that was ordered 
uh, against us was in order to was something to disclose all emails, all correspondence. That, when we actually complied with the order, went to 78,000 documents. Disclosure has become a massive minefield in relation to litigation. Selection of uh, legal team is the next important uh, point. I'm going to say something that you might not imagine a lawyer to say. Please, people, don't reinvent the wheel. There are experts out there in particular types of fields and casualties. If somebody's done one of these cases before, give serious consideration to using them again because they know the process. And I'm not just saying that as a CJC pitch. If you've got a piracy incident, if it was me, I'd be going to Steve. Uh, Instant Co, I'd be going to James Gosling at, at Holman's because if it's about rescuing crews, they know how to do it. It's tried and tested. The system's there. Don't pay for it twice. Don't reinvent the wheel. Think out of the box in relation to the selection of experts. On this case, the science became so intense, it was no good going to, although the fantastic, the Brooks Bells, the CWAs, the LOCs, this was science completely beyond what they normal deal with, normally deal with. So you ended up going to professors at Cambridge, Oxford, at Leeds, which is the Institute of Fluid Dynamics and Heat Transfer. We went to the McLaren Formula One team in order to formulate how heat transfer works to show what heat had actually come from the bunker tank into a container. Think about doing things unusual to test experimentation and prove cases. This might sound incredible to you, but one of the points that got this case home saved CSAV $40 million in relation to the original settlement, eventually won them $105 million in the recourse that they were successful against uh, the shipper, was by doing as much as we could to show to a court what was happening in that ship. We're a charterer. How do we know what was happening in the number three hold of that ship? Answer is we built number three hold in Harland and Wolf, full size, and we ran temperature experiments for four months, showing what would happen. Be careful of your experts. I'm looking at time, so I'm going to run ahead. And don't let the tail wag the dog, people. The team has to work together. Don't let the legal team start to run away with it. Attention to detail. These cases gather their own momentum. Beware of insider fighting. It's what I said again. It's no good having the best individuals in the world if they're not playing as a team. Look at the cost implications. Aconcagua ended up running up costs of about £3.7 million in its 10 years of litigation. There is an incentive to uh, settle there. Evidence is king. Evidence is vital and wins, wins these cases. Look at opportunities to forum shop. First limitation case ever in Chile meant that all the cargo claims were settled out effectively and think about mediation and ADR. They're expensive, they're complex, they easily run wild like the explosions and the fires, fires that go off. But do this, ETA, evidence, teams and analysis and remember to protect the rights of recourse because Article 4, Rule 6 is the way home. Thank you.